Um, so we talked a little bit about how the fractional distillation is used in, in the petroleum industry to refine crude petroleum. Um, and you wind up, instead of what you guys saw in the lab, where you basically have different things coming out the top of your fractional distillation at different times and temperatures, by keeping it to be a continuous process, they basically can just take samples at different heights along that column instead of waiting for it to come all the way through. Um, and you'll be you'd probably not be surprised to know that they use every piece of crude petroleum. Gasoline is actually a tiny portion um, of what they actually use crude petroleum for. They make everything useful. Um, and some of the more surprising ones, though, are down here in that boiling range of 200 to 400 Celsius and higher. Um, if you, I know we talked actually last last uh, lab, a few of you guys are from the East Coast, um, and where they still use a lot of heating oil in the winter to keep warm, as opposed to having natural gas furnaces or electric furnaces. Um, heating oil is is delivered to big tanks in older buildings, um, and they burn it to heat the building. Um, and so that's actually a one of the major reasons that um, the price of gasoline goes down in the winter. It's not just that people are driving less, it's also that they have to ramp up production of heating oil to make sure people on the East Coast don't freeze to death in the winter. Um, and as a result, they're still gonna make the same, the same percentage of the crude petroleum still turned into gasoline. So not only does demand go down for gasoline, supply goes up because they can't stop producing the gasoline and they don't want to store the gasoline and they being the, the uh, oil companies. Um, and so if you have to make heating oil, you might as well be making gasoline, but that just makes the prices drop. Um, and so we're about to start seeing that, right? It'll be nice when gas prices drop some more. Um, hey, Sean, I have a question about fractional yeah. distillation. Um, yeah. Uh, while you're on the topic, remember from the lab, um, we were measuring the volumes for simple and fractional. Um, in the lab apparatus, were you still collecting all of your distillate at the end, even with fractional? Yes. So the, we don't have a, a specific dedicated fractional distillation column that has those different ports, like a, like a petroleum um, distillation column. So we're collecting everything from the same point. It still is going to start down at the bottom, go up through that column, hit the, the distillation head, which is where we're monitoring temperature. And then, and then is uh, being collected after it goes through the second condenser over here. All right, so both of these are the are condensers that are going to be cooled usually, or and this one's probably going to be packed with with copper or glass beads are also commonly used. Um, but we're collecting everything over here. We just have a very, very distinct point where if we looked at this in the middle of the process, if we started down here with a mixture of everything. Um, and one of the, the uh, video on fractional distillation that I posted actually does a pretty good job of showing graphically what's going on too, better than I can probably draw here. Sorry. Um, and so if we have a mixture of the red compound and the blue compound, halfway through the distillation, the red compound might be mostly up here and the blue compound might be mostly down here. Um, as it's condensing and re-evaporating and condensing and re-evaporating. And once it gets up to the top, that's when we actually see the temperature change. And we'll see the temperature that we'll record will be the boiling point of whatever that compound is that comes out first. And then all of that's going to be collected and then the temperature will skyrocket up again when the blue compound gets up there. But we're still going to collect it over this. So we're, instead of just keeping it going continuously, and collecting at whatever, you know, if, if we're doing it continuously, this entire column is going to be at a constant temperature. It's gonna have a constant temperature gradient where it's hotter at the bottom, cooler at the top. 
we're not doing this continuously. We're using what's called a batch process. And so why continuously heating at the bottom, the bottom's gonna continuously get warmer and warmer. And so everything will keep getting driven upward and eventually make it to the end. If we kept the bottom at a constant temperature, then essentially these would stay where they were. They would stay to the point where the column was the same temperature as their boiling point. And so that's what the petroleum um, refineries do is they keep everything at a constant temperature so that they know whatever is condensing at this height must have this boiling point. And it's more sophisticated than that. They, you know, they monitor their temperatures. They're not just going off of calculations and, and guessing. Um, but they're, it's, it's set up differently. It doesn't need to be a batch process where it goes all the way through like it is for us. Um, and actually I have on the next slide, not, not just because I find the engineering to be really interesting because I think it is a really cool um, figure. This is the, the technical flow chart for the process of a um, refinery, a petroleum refinery, um, where essentially you bring in crude oil and that crude oil gets to the bottom of this big section here, which is the, the column. And then that column is heated with steam usually, um, which, and they, all of these, these sections where they have this little symbol here is where they're using the hot stuff they've already heated up to actually warm up the stuff that's coming in. So they, they really have figured out ways to be very, very efficient with their heating and with their, their, um, uh, process. They don't. They don't just take the hot stuff that they couldn't distill and then just you know go and let it cool down on its own. They use it to warm up the next batch of stuff that's coming in, um, because that's even more efficient. Um, and so then you wind up. And this is generally all done at about two atmospheres. They keep them pressurized a lot of the time. Um, and then all of these little sections like this are where they're they're able to. Um, you know, pull up, pour off the different or take the different samples of different components. So you've got jet, naphtha, jet fuel, light gas oil, heavy gas oil, and residue. Fuel, um, a residue is what you actually make asphalt with. Um, so they, like I said, even the waste, the really, really garbage, black, tarry stuff at the bottom, that's basically the only thing they can't get pure. Um, they still find a use for it. And that's, that's what we pave roads with. Um, so it's, it's, uh, they've had a couple hundred years at this point, 150 years to really, really refine this process. And engineers are pretty clever people when you give them um, incentives. And so they've been pretty, they've been able to design these very, very well. Um, and this is actually what chemical engineering is compared to chemistry as a major. Chemical engineering is designing things like this to be as efficient as possible versus chemistry is studying the actual reactions that might be happening and figuring out what the process might be for the first time. And then the engineer takes the science that the chemists do and the engineers find out a way to make it economically viable. Um, you know, something like making, making your refinery run half a percent more efficiently as far as their um, their energy bill goes, will save that company potentially millions of dollars a year. Um, so tiny little increases in efficiency are huge uh, when it comes to things like pharmaceuticals and oil refineries. Um, all right. So if we're getting back to the science rather than the engineering. We talk about some new ways of drawing these structures in 3D because we're gonna we're going to start needing to show three dimensional structure a little bit more than we have. Um, so the wedge and dash system we've been using for a little bit now, um, and that's pretty pretty common, really really functional, easy to wrap your head around once you get get the hang of what's going on. Um, this sawhorse projection is a little bit less common, a little bit less useful, um, but you do still see it occasionally. But this Newman projection um, is, is going to be very, very important when it comes to analyzing these conformers. 
Um, and it just every time makes me think of Seinfeld. Hello, Newman. You guys will learn to, to feel that same way about the word Newman from these Newman projections. Um, basically, if you if you picture this molecule on the left, all you're doing to get to these other two, two ways of drawing it is you're taking it and rotating it around. If you if you look at that line that's drawn that has the arrow here, you're saying, okay, imagine that's the axis that's staying constant. You're going to take this and rotate it around that axis so that you're looking down this line. You're looking straight down this line, arra arranging it so that you're, the carbon in front obscures the carbon behind. Right, and so what that allows us to do is basically line these things up, whatever's attached to those two carbons, we can then arrange them in a way we can see what's gonna bump into each other. Because that's what the, all of these conformers are going to come down to is how do we arrange things so that the large objects are as far apart from each other as possible. Um, you can think of it a little bit if you're going on a road trip with four people um, and you've got four 200 or you've got two 250 pound guys and um, two people that are only 150 pounds, you probably are not going to put the two 250 pound guys both in the back seat together, right? Naturally, it's going to be most stable if you put one of the big guys in the front and one, one of the big guys in the back. Keep the largest objects apart from each other so that they're less likely to bump into each other. All right, so that's that's essentially what these what these conformers are going to do. And the Newman projection makes it really easy to see how we can do that because we are also now allowed to, if we have all single bonds here, we're allowed to rotate around that carbon bond, right? So if one of these red hydrogens was actually something larger and one of the blue ones was actually something larger, we can twist it however we want to get the two biggest things away from each other. Um, so let's try drawing one of these. So in when, when I ask you to draw a Newman projection, I'll usually kind of try to indicate where you, where your eye should be. Um, you sh I'm probably not going to draw it myself. I will steal figures from other people um, because you don't want to see my artistic abilities. Um, we're, if we're trying to draw dibromobutane, as though we were looking down the bond between carbon two and carbon three. Draw what this conformer would look like. All right, I'm going to redraw this molecule the way it's drawn here first, and then I'll, I'll go through the process. So it was bromine. Let me get zoomed in a little bit here. No, I still didn't leave myself enough room. All 
All right. So if this is the compound we're looking at, we're trying to look at it along that line there. What we're going to be seeing, if we look down that line, is if you picture this circle that we're going to draw is the first carbon here. And so this first carbon is going to have something coming basically straight down from the middle. It's going to have something up and to the right. And it's going to have something up and to the left. So the question is, what do we put on each of those spots? So if we're from this direction and this is up, the one that's coming straight down is going to be a CH3 group. It's going to be a methyl group, right? It's this first carbon here that's pointed straight down. Again, all we do is take this and turn it sideways. So what was in the plane of the board is now going to be straight up or straight down. What was coming out of the board is going to be on our right-hand side. So right here, we would have that first bromine. You can label these in the right color. And then what's the last thing that's attached to this carbon here? Hydrogen. Hydrogen. It's not drawn, it's hydrogen. Would it be OK to leave the H3 off that carbon? Um, we're going to get into some cases where you're going to have more than one carbon attached here, where that might be a CH3 and that might be a CH2, CH3, an ethyl group. So it's a good idea to remember to write those hydrogens. All right, so the, the second carbon we can't see directly. It's behind this first carbon. And so we draw the lines not going all the way to the middle and basically being in the empty spots left um, between these three things attached to the first carbon. All right. And so if we were looking at it straight on, remember, whatever was flat in the plane of the board is now up or down, right? Because we took this and now we're looking at it edge on. So the methyl group is going to be where? On top. On the top. Where's the bromine going to be? To the right. Which means our hydrogen is in that last spot. All right, so I really like these, these type of problems because they force you to remember that this is a three-dimensional object and to practice taking that object and rotating it mentally in your head, All right? Because it's easy to forget when we get used to our rules for using wedges and dots, you know, yeah, we know that they're there, but it's really easy to just think about this as a flat thing we draw on a piece of paper. We're going to have to pretty soon be able to pick these up in our heads and rotate them around different ways. And if you're unsure, you could try doing this in MoleView, although MoleView doesn't always get the 3D structure right. When you go from 2D to 3D, it doesn't always get the stereochemistry right. So you might, it, it's useful for um, looking at a molecule and dragging it around and seeing what it looks like in 3D, but it doesn't always give you the right answer. Um, for these things, because if we switch the bromine from being sticking out to being sticking in, that's actually a different molecule. We'll find out pretty soon. And that's what MoleView doesn't get right. So you can't always use MoleView to check your answer on these. Um, and if you're trying to figure out how that would be a different molecule, just hang on, we'll get there soon.
All right, so why does this matter so much? Well, if we look at this Newman projection here, not all of the, we have three different objects attached to each of these carbons, and they're all going to be different sizes. Um, a, a CH3 group is bigger than a hydrogen, significantly bigger than a hydrogen. But when we look at how big a bromine is, just mostly based on the number of electrons, bromines are way bigger than a carbon is. Um, bromine, remember, is, so it goes fluorine is in the same room in the same row as carbon, and then chlorine is below that, and then bromine is below that. So we're in the n equals four row of the periodic table, which means we have four energy levels full of electrons full here that are filled here, taking up a lot of space. So these are our bromines are our big 250 pound dudes and on our road trip. They're going to naturally want to be as far apart from each other as possible. And so the way we would the most stable conformer of this would actually be the one where we could get the bromines further apart from each other. So lucky for us, there's nothing that's really prohibiting them from twisting around. We don't have a double bond here or anything. We don't have any a ring structure that's going to keep it stuck as this conformer. So if we wanted to make these bromines as far apart as possible, we would want this bromine to be over here, right? If we just think about taking this molecule, taking the part that's towards you and twisting it and keeping the back part the same, right? Because it's just a sigma bond that's rotationally symmetric, there's nothing that keeps us from twisting it wherever we want. So if we took this the blue substituents and rotated everything 120 degrees, we could get a more stable conformer that would look like the bromine moves over here. The hydrogen, we can't break the bond. So the hydrogen can't just switch with the bromine. We took this and we rotated it. So if the bromine was here, hydrogen was here, hydrogen's now at the bottom in that methyl CH3 group rotates up to the top. All right, so we didn't break any bonds to do that. I had to erase things to do that, but if we actually built a 3D molecule of this to show, and this is one of the reasons that, that 3D um, models are actually are useful in, in OCHEM, is you can actually get from what I had drawn first to this conformer without breaking any bonds, just by twisting it around that middle. All right, so ho hopefully you can visualize that. It's like, like spinning a fan blade, basically. Keep the back that you can keep the back the same and twist the front or the other way around if you wanted to. We could keep the front where it is and twist the back. So if you really wanted to be able to visualize this um, while you are you know, getting ready for winter and putting away your, um, your oscillating fans and everything, you could take a fan and you could actually you know, draw on with Sharpie on each of the blades, CH3, BR, H, and then spin it and you, you know, that's literally what we're doing. We're just taking this and rotating it. Your roommates might think you're crazy. I have no idea what's going on. I'd be, I think that'd be, my sense of humor, would be, that'd be a fun thing to leave for them to discover in the summer, next spring when they take it out. Why the hell were you writing about bromine on our fan? All right, so we're going to add a couple more. Hey, so let's try going back the other way first before I go back to slides. We changed the conformer we had drawn here, right? So let's try and take this new Newman projection and redraw it the other way. Redraw it as skeletal structure with the dots and wedges to try and, and practice going back and forth. So if we were looking now, at our two molecules, all we did was before was we took the flat molecule and we rotated to look edge on right. So now if we're looking edge on, we're going to take it and rotate it back. So 
So we still have that carbon two to carbon three bond is still in the same spot. The right hand side of the molecule is going to look the same because we didn't rotate anything. So we had the CH3 going up into the right, coming out towards us. Just keep my color scheme consistent here. Bromine was coming out towards us, up into the right, and in the plane of the board was the CH3. And then the hydrogen that we didn't draw is behind the bromine. So then the carbon two to carbon three bond kept it where it was. So then what do we have attached to this other carbon now? It did have the bromine sticking out towards us, but now the bromine has been rotated into the board. Because if we take this and go and flatten it, the bromine is behind the rest of the molecule. That CH3 group is now going to be sticking out towards us. And I didn't write CH3 here, but for the sake of consistency, I could do that. And then the last one that we didn't we didn't uh, explicitly write out, so might as well write both of these out. Sorry, not going backwards. In the plane of the board is the hydrogen. And then if I'm explicitly writing out the hydrogen on this side too, the hydrogen is going to be what's behind the bromine. So you can see why we don't necessarily this way when we're trying to draw the skeletal structure. We don't, when you're drawing the skeletal structure, the most convenient way to draw it is not always and frequent and um, is usually not the most stable conformer. Because the easiest way to draw this was one, two, three, four carbons, draw your bromines. Not showing where the carbons were, just make all the carbons flat. But that's not the most stable state when it comes to looking at the actual three dimensional shape of this molecule. Sean, just to confirm that bromine in pink on the right, that's coming towards you, right? This one? Yeah. This one is, so when we do these Newman projections and we're taking these, if these, um, three-dimensional shape we took. So I, you can bend my fingers just right. I drew this one upside down to do this properly. Um, it, you can approximate what the angles are on a tetrahedral structure by taking your, your first three fingers, your thumb, your pointer finger, and your middle finger, and kind of pointing them the same direction as spread out as they can be. And then, so that's roughly what those directions are going to be when you're attached here, except yeah, more like that. So the my pointer finger would be the, the methyl group here. My middle finger would be the hydrogen and my thumb would be the bromine. And so when we took that and we rotated it, all three of them are realistically gonna be pointed away from us a little bit because they're all kind of going into the board. They're gonna be roughly 120 degrees from each other when you look at it from above. The way that my fingers, if you look at them from this side, there, I can't quite make my fingers 120 degrees from each other. Um, maybe if I use my other hand from, um, but they're all going to be pointed roughly away from you, but kind of close to 120 degrees from each other. That's what we're looking at with the reds. And the blue ones are going to be the opposite. They're going to be pointed slightly towards us. I don't know if you've ever, I don't play guitar seriously or very well, but I have played for a long time. And so you can actually tell the difference by my, my hands. The hand that I use to put the fret is it's a much larger range of motion than my right hand. Um, so, so I said, maybe if I use my other hand, I could make it look better. But as if you look that at somebody sense. who's played classical guitar for a long time, their hand, their left hand is 
way bigger range of motion than your right than their right hand. It's kind of crazy. All right. So when we're trying to decide which of these is going to be the best conformer to draw, there's a few other terms that we're going to, to discuss. Um, and actually, let me get let me get zoomed out real quick. Don't like having my camera zoomed in too much while I'm doing slides. Um, all right. It's like looking at yourself, a picture of yourself zoomed in way too much, you know, nobody likes that. Um, when we're talking about the different ways we can draw these, this first way we drew this, um, where we had everything, where we had the, the red lines in the gaps from the blue lines, is what's called the, the staggered conformer. Um, and so the staggered shape is just what you would expect. Basically, everything sort of settles so that um, you've got everything on the back carbon is has its substituents in the gaps from the front carbon. So that when you look at it from the front, it looks like you've got something every 60 degrees, essentially. Um, and so that's what's drawn here. Um, however, if we're taking that and rotating it, there's going to be some state along the way. Let's see if I can do this with the camera. So if you look at least the top half of my fingers, you can see that my this finger is in between the other two from this side, right? If I want to take this and rotate it, there's going to be some point along the way where everything lines up with each other, where everything is basically um, is hiding what's behind it. And so they call it the eclipsed conformer because the, whatever you have in the front is gonna eclipse whatever you have in the back, just like a solar eclipse, right? So, and that angle that we're describing, that rotational angle um, actually has its own name. Cause it's not truly an angle like we would think about an angle in geometry. Um, it's three dimensional geometry. So it's a little bit different. An angle in geometry is flat, right? This is what's called a dihedral angle, because instead of marking the angle between two lines like you would in geometry, you will make, we're actually marking the angle between two planes in three-dimensional space. So if, you, if this hand is the front carbon, this hand is the back carbon, where there's a plane that's flat in each, direct, in each dimension, right? and we're moving them closer or further apart from each other in three dimensions. So it's not just looking at what's the angle between three things to actually measure a dihedral angle. It has to be in three dimensions and you have to have four points. And your four points would be, again, if you, if you think about measuring an angle in geometry or physics, you had three points, right? Um, a to B to C, and you would measure that angle, right? That's a two-dimensional angle and it requires three points to define it. If we're in three dimensions and we're trying to define a dihedral angle, we actually need four points. The first three points are gonna define the first plane and then the last point is going to be basically be how far out of plane is that last small is that last atom. And so if we think of the the first three points here as being bromine to carbon two to carbon three, which is behind carbon two, our last point would be something attached to carbon three, and it's basically going to say okay. And then you take you take that plane and rotate it 60 degrees. It's kind of hard to visualize. We'll get more practice with that. Um, one of the benefits of not being in person labs is you guys are going to get practice visualizing these things in 3D, especially when we get to next quarter, I have a whole project 
um, about drawing things in 3D, where you guys will have to get used to it. Um, and get used to some of the vocab that goes along with it, which is a good thing to be used to, because like I mentioned before, pretty much everything is run by computers these days. Nobody is actually, very few people, I should say, are actually running columns by hand anymore in research labs. Um, basically, it's a, it's a historical skill that you guys learn to learn the basics so that you can understand what the computers are doing. So if our staggered conformer is usually going to be our lowest energy, because that's how you can get those, those substituents on the carbon. A substituent is anything attached to a carbon. We just talk, talk about whatever's attached to a carbon is um, a substituent or a substitution or a substituted group. Um, whatever's attached to those carbons is going to be most stable when they're in staggered conformer, but that means there's going to be, there's going to be a maximum as well, right? If you can have minimum possible energies, you can have maximum possible energies, which in terms of, of uh, energy terms, back from Gen Chem, we would call those transition states. We're going to have transition states, which are going to be where you, a, you have to go through a high energy state to get from one stable state to another stable state, right? So just like if you're trying to go to Carson City from South Lake, you if those are both stable states because they're you know you're at the bottom of a potential energy well, you're at the at a stable latitude or altitude, you have to go through Spooner to get there. You have to go up and through a pass to get from one stable state to another stable state. And if you took, if you took a, a bowling ball and you took it and you put it on highway 50 at state line, it might not necessarily roll anywhere. State line's pretty flat, right? It might be stable sitting right there at the bottom of, of uh, highway 50 on state line. If you did the same thing in Carson City with a bowling ball, the bowling ball might stay right where you put it. If you took a bowling ball to the top of Spooner and you set it down, it's going to roll one way or the other, right? If you pick right at the very top of the pass, it has to roll one way or the other because it's either downhill towards Carson or downhill towards South Lake. So that's what a transition state is, is that state where you're at the peak of an energy before you start heading downhill again. Right, so if our staggered conformers are going to be the downhill, the eclipsed conformers are going to be our transition states, are going to be our passes. So in your example with uh, the bromines, um, would both of those have been staggered conformations? Correct. So, and let's, let's actually draw what it would look like in between. So this was the state we said was going to be the most stable. And we started with it looking like bromine to the right, the CH3 was straight down, hydrogen here. So those are our, our two staggered states we were looking at, right? Our, our eclipse state, our transition state between the two. And again, I'm going to keep the red ones not moving. Are going to be in the same directions as the ones that aren't moving. And then we had something that looks like that. And so we were, if we were going from this one, we're taking this and rotating that way. So straight up would be the blue bromine. 
to the right hand side would be the methyl group. And then we have our two hydrogens would be in the eclipsed position as well. Right, so in order to get from here to here, you have to go through the state in between, which is going to be less stable because we've got everything lined up so that they're all pushing each other away on their way to becoming more stable. Right, and so this would be our transition state in between these two complements. Do you mind if I ask a question? Not at all. Is uh, this something that uh, you know people currently are you know manipulating in labs and stuff? Not really. When we look at what the energy barriers are between these, um, so this is for for a simpler molecule. This is just for ethane, but they can we can actually calculate what the energies are for the eclipse versus the staggered. And if it's ethane, all of the the things you have, all the substituents on each carbon are all hydrogens, right? And so there's nothing that's really um, that's really any bigger than anything on the other side. So it's going to be a symmetrical. It's going to basically be sine wave shaped in this case, because as you twist those two things around, if you just think about twisting it at a, at a constant rate, it's going to be, OK, eclipsed, staggered, eclipsed, staggered as you keep rotating in 360 degrees. Um, and, and but when you look at how big the barrier is, 12 kilojoules per mole, that's something that we can actually estimate at room temperature that a reaction that's slow at room temperature but happens would be might take up to 100 kilojoules per mole. So at room temperature, this is 12 kilojoules per mole. Um, a, so let me let me work in the math backwards. A difference of five kilojoules per mole in terms of a transition state height is a factor of 10 difference as far as the rate goes. So this basically that transition state energy is going to determine how fast the reaction happens. If you decrease the transition state by five kilojoules per mole, it speeds the reaction up by a factor of 10. I think maybe two. Either way, it's exponential difference. Um, and so having this barrier only be 12 kilojoules per mole, and we can say that a reaction will happen even if it's slow at 100 kilojoules per mole, means that this is happening so fast at room temperature that we can't actually at room temperature even isolate these specific conformers. Um, as we start adding bigger things than hydrogens on, these transition states will start getting bigger and bigger. In those cases, we can say, okay, 90% of the time it's in this conformer. But these things are constantly switching back and forth. In order to actually get these things to slow down and be stuck in one conformer, you have to start getting down to liquid nitrogen temperatures. If you took this, these, and you slowed these molecules down to liquid nitrogen temperatures, that's going, that might be enough to actually force them to stay in one conformer. But for the most part, we're not necessarily going to be um, able to isolate these but it's going to impact how we talk about some of some molecules in the future. So we're starting with the simple cases and we're going to expand on that. So, and I mentioned it earlier, but if you, you may not have caught it. So if this is, if this is for ethane and every time two hydrogens pass each other, it has an energy barrier of four kilojoules per mole. And since we have three hydrogens, three sets of hydrogens that have to pass each other every time we go through a, a eclipsed conformer here, four kilojoules plus four kilojoules plus four kilojoules is a total of 12 kilojoules per mole of barrier to get these things to rotate. If we replaced one of those hydrogens with a methyl group, would that barrier be bigger or smaller? Bigger. I see a few people mouthing it. 
um, without unmuting. And that's fine when I can read your lips well enough. I can tell the difference between bigger and smaller. Um, yeah, we would expect this barrier to be bigger for propane because we have physically a larger object that's stuck there, right? So it's going to be harder to get that, um, that methyl group to rotate past the hydrogen than it was, would be for two hydrogens. We can go back to our road trip analogy. Hydrogens are like, are like five-year-olds in a car. They don't take up much space. If you wanted to get two, two five-year-olds to switch seats in a car without getting out of the car, that'd be really easy to do, right? Well, trying to get a five-year-old to switch places with a, with a 16-year-old is gonna be a lot harder because a 16-year-old just takes up more space. 16-year-old's a methyl group. And bromine, like in our other example, is our 250 pound adult male. That's gonna be even harder. And trying to get two 250 pound adults to change seats inside a car without getting out, it's gonna be almost impossible, right? The more, the bigger the objects are, the harder it's going to be for them to push past each other, basically. And in fact, um, that is what we see. I thought I had the numbers for the propane next, but we'll do this one when we come back. Let's take our break, come back in 10 minutes at uh, nine o'clock, and we'll start by trying doing more practice drawing this compromer of butane.
All right, so if you guys want to start uh, working on this, if you haven't yet, try drawing the Newman projection for butane here for this specific conformer of butane. Hey, Sean, I got a question about this. Yeah. So then all, uh, these shapes are just, like, they're just constantly moving. So it's kind of like um, that uh, example you did in Gen Chem with wavelength where you don't really tell like if it's going up or down, it's just, it's going all the time. So you just have to think of it like that. Yeah, it's, it's um, if you think of a, a ball on a roulette wheel that's spinning, there's moments where it settles into one spot and then bounces out and goes to the next spot. That's kind of what's happening here. And if we slowed it all the way down to liquid nitrogen, that would be like letting the wheel slow down to the point where it picked one conformer and was stuck okay. there. Okay, all right, cool. are we looking at this top down again? Sorry, yeah, look from carbon two to carbon three. So from the left-hand side towards the right-hand side along that middle bond. Excuse me. All right, so I'm going to take it off a of share. So make sure you actually I'll, I'll write down the primary structure or the uh, structures it's given first. And so a couple things to pay attention to here. Um, one that is, as we get used to drawing tetrahedral structures in general, if we're using the dots and the wedges, um, you're almost, the easiest way to draw it is generally going to be do, do two straight lines where you've got your, um, those are the bonds that are in the plane of the board. And if you put those at, a, at about 120 degrees from each other, you've split the remaining 120 degree or the hundred remaining 240 degrees. Um, and like you've got two things that are both turning it into um, a circle that's evenly split up, but one of those, there's gonna be one object pointing towards you and one object pointing away from you. They're both in the same general direction away from the other two. So if you tried to draw a tetrahedral structure, if you did it like that, that wouldn't be accurate because this, this um, hydrogen that's moved, that's pointed away from us should be pointed in roughly, oh, I'll just switch to a new pen and that one does not erase cleanly. Awesome. Um, so you're, you're going to put those, the two bonds that are not flat are always going to be pointed in generally the same direction, right? So get get used to drawing it that way. Don't draw. The only reason to ever draw um, a bond with a wedge not pointed the same direction as the other one is if you have some some sort of restricted motion, like it's a ring structure. If it's part of a ring structure, that's a little different, and you can get things to be forced to be in in angles they wouldn't normally be in. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, but for the most part, tetrahedral structures, you're always going to have two bonds flat, a bond out, and a bond away pointed in roughly the same direction. 
Um, so if we're trying to take this and turn it into the Newman projection, we're trying to look from along that line there. If we're taking this, rotating it out, again, whatever was flat is now pointed straight in and out. So our our front carbon is going to look something like this. Oh, wow, that green really doesn't show up much, does it? Can you guys see that? If Iffy? All right, I'll stay away from the green. Um, and if we're looking at that that those first things that both of the two objects that are pointed upward are both hydrogens, right? And the object that's going to be pointed downward, the substituent pointed downward is going to be a CH3, it's going to be a methyl group, is this group right here. So then, and again, if we're looking, this is drawn as, as a staggered conformer. We can kind of tell because on this side, are, we have hydrogen in the plane of the board that's going to be basically splitting the difference between these two hydrogens, right? So that shows us that it's going to be in the staggered conformation. So we're going to have something sticking straight up is a hydrogen this hydrogen here we have we're going to have if we took this and rotated it what was into the board is now on our left hand side the other way of thinking about it rather than taking this and rotating it is if you had this molecule if you stepped into the board and looked at it from the side if that's easier for you to visualize moving your own head rather than moving the molecule that works too. So if we're looking at it here and then we step sideways, whatever was into the board is now on our left. So hydrogen was into the board there. It's now on our left. What was in front of the board is now on our right. So hopefully that looks close to what you have. Um, hey, Sean. Yeah. When we're writing this out, do we need to um, be paying attention? Because like, so on yours, it looks like the front hydrogen, like the green one, um, that's like a Y. When I drew it on my paper, I did like an upside down Y. Does that matter? Um, it doesn't. Basically, you're just. Because it's like the same thing. But I just went like, when we're drawing it, are you going to be looking for that kind of like that specific? I'm going to be looking for, did you get the right, are these things in the right position relative to each other? So as long as you want, you drew a version of it where the two methyls were next to each other, that should be good. Okay. Um, the reason I drew it like, like a Y is if we're viewing it from the left hand side of the molecule, um, in order to have that Y drawn upside down, we would need to be standing with our feet on the ceiling which it's still the same molecule if you draw it that way. Um, it's just not the first thing that came to mind for me. What would the, if we had the same molecule, still butane, and we want to draw the most stable conformer, what would it look like? Those Everybody's threes like, would be yeah. opposing. Yeah, we want these to not just be staggered, but we want them to be staggered on opposite sides as much as possible. So we would need to rotate either the front or the back. In either way, it doesn't matter. The main thing, and it wouldn't make a difference in this molecule, but there are some molecules where, where it does matter. You can't just switch a hydrogen 
and the, and a methyl group. You have to rotate the whole thing. So if I go to, I really want this blue one to work. So I'm going to try using this blue one again and hope it erases better this time. Blue and green hydrogens on the front. just so we can tell the difference between them. If we're gonna take the front and rotate it, actually probably wanna rotate it the other way, right? To get the methyls opposite from each other in only one step. It wouldn't be wrong if you rotated this counterclockwise. Um, you would just have to do rotate it two places to get there. Versus if we rotate it clockwise, we can do it in one step. So the, the blue hydrogen, that's a little bit better, is gonna move to the right-hand side. The green hydrogen is gonna be at the bottom position and the methyl group rotated up into the left. And I know I've been doing this a few times already. Um, H3C versus CH3. It's really a convenience thing. The main thing is with methyl groups or with any of these condensed structures, we want to try and make sure we're drawing the bond to something that's not a hydrogen. So if I'm drawing something where the bond is moving, is going to the right, I wouldn't usually write it as CH3 like that, because that looks like I'm drawing a bond from the hydrogen to the middle carbon. It's, it's a small thing, but I'm really, and I'm not gonna mark you down for it, but this is the same thing, just drawn with the hydrogens out of the way. All right, is everybody getting the, getting the hang of being able to visualize this a little bit? It does take a little bit of practice. And this is actually one of the things I, I like to uh, cite this study because it justifies me playing video games a lot when I was in grad school, um, is that they've actually done some studies that since, since vid 3D video games have come out, um, there's a positive correlation between people who play video games and people who do well in organic chemistry. Not a causation necessarily. There's a lot of lurking variables. Maybe it's just that um, organic chemistry preferentially uh, is slightly has an implicit bias against women and women are also less likely to pay, play video games. But it could, I, I think that there, it actually makes a good argument for being able to, to, if you can play video games in 3D, you're better at being able to look at a 2D surface and see three dimensions, which is basically what we're trying to do here. Um, Again, that might just be me reaching because I like playing video games, but. My psych professor cited a similar study about video games. Good, so it's not just me then. Um, let's see, where are we going from here? Let's go back to slides. Um, it, if we actually plot the, um, the, so this is what's called a potential energy surface. And I've used that term before. Um, what potential energy surface is just referring to um, what the energy looks like as you move through a reaction or through a particular change in a molecule. Um, does it go up in energy or down in energy? Does it become more stable or less stable as you move through a, a system? Um, so in this case, if we look at, bent, at uh, butane, if we start from the staggered conformer, um, where they're in they're the most stable state, which is called the anti-configuration. So we're, um, there's a lot of different ways of describing very specific things, right? So staggered just means that your conformers or that your, your substituents are not eclipsed. Anti is specifically saying putting the two biggest things on opposite sides from each other which is slightly different, right? Because we started with an, with an staggered conformer that was not anti on that last problem because we had the two methyl groups adjacent to each other in our Newman projection, which is a, 
which look, would look like this second structure here, which is called a Gauche structure. Um, and I actually, frankly, don't know where Gauche comes from or even what it means. So if anybody knows any French or German and that sounds familiar to you. Isn't it um, left in French? Left? I think. Sure. Uh, Roche, I think. I don't know. I'll look it up. Um, I'll, I'll look it up too, uh, just because now I'm curious. Um, it's, we usually, in, uh, in English or in chemistry, we pronounce it gauche. Um, and I won't, I won't make the mistake of saying that chemistry is the same as speaking English. It's kind of its own thing, right? Um, so, but if we look at these, if we start with them in the anti-configuration, when we rotate the two, the two methyls past each other, Actually, that would be rotating a hydrogen past a methyl to get from the state at 180 degrees. If our, if our carbons start 180 degrees from each other, to go from 180 to 60 degrees from each other, each carbon has to, has to push past the hydrogen to get there. And we see a, a bigger jump in the transition state energy too. It was 12 kilojoules per mole when it was all hydrogen. So now it's 16 kilojoules per mole. And then that gets us into this gauche configuration where you've got your, your carbons adjacent to each other. Their, their dihedral angle is 60 degrees. So they're still in a staggered conformation, but those two carbons are next to each other, like the, what we started with on the last page. So you wouldn't necessarily use gauche to describe an eclipsed conformer, right? No. Um, and off the top of my head, I don't know if there's a specific term for for referring to this first um, this first transition state where you've got the two methyls pushing past each pushing past the hydrogen, but not past each other. I we would probably just describe that by saying that they the methyls were eclipsed in an eclipsed configuration with the hydrogens as opposed to the methyls eclipsing each other. Um, but there may be a, a term I'm forgetting. Uh, my memory is not what it once was. Um, so, but once we get to that Gauss, Gauss configuration, we can actually look at it and we can calculate that that Gauss conformer is actually about four kilojoules per mole less stable. Having those two methyl groups in the anti-configuration where they're 180 degrees from each other, it loses about four kilojoules per mole of stability when you force them to be next to each other, even if they're still, um, still staggered. And then if we go from there and the two methyls push past each other, that's a, that's a we have to go uphill in energy 19 kilojoules per mole to get that from the, from the baseline. And then when that settles back down into the other Gauche conformer, it's really the same conformer, right? It's either you've got your, your two carbons that are um, adjacent to each other. Either way, it's just adjacent to the right-hand side or adjacent to the left-hand side. So that should be the same energy. And we do see it's, it's symmetrical. And if we look at this whole surface, you draw a line right down the middle. The left-hand side is identical to the right-hand side because you've got all of the same interactions happening just with different atoms, just in a different position, different angle. All right, so we're, and if you go all the way to, all the way around 360 degrees, you wind up back where we started with the two methyls in the anti-configuration, which again, just like we predicted, and not, you don't, I don't necessarily expect you to be able to remember these numbers off the top of your head. I'll give you a few rules um, in, a, in a little bit when we get more comfortable with this to be able to estimate roughly what the numbers might be, but I don't want you to worry about memorizing these numbers. More important is, can you predict which one is, which is the most stable conformer versus the least um, relative to each other? So any staggered conformer is going to be better than any eclipsed conformer, pretty much across the board. I think I can say that. Um, and any 
any staggered conformer where you get your biggest objects further away from each other is going to be the most favorable. Anytime you've got your biggest objects close to each other, that's going to be your least favorable. All right, so here's a more, a, uh, a way to describe this. It's a little bit less um, hand-holding, I guess, in terms of I'm not going to tell you how to draw your Newman projection. So you can draw it however you like. But if we're rotating only the C3 to C4 bond, so rotating only this bond, What's the lowest energy and the highest energy confirmations? Okay, so start by trying to draw the Newman projection for the way it is, and then figure out what's going to be the best way and the worst way to have them. And I'm going to go get a glass of water. So I forced myself to wait long enough for you guys to try it first. All right, good. I'm going to go ahead and start drawing this out. Um, also worth mentioning there, um, my wife is in a meeting right now that just reminded me that they're working on publishing the schedule for spring quarter, um, which is going to look on paper different. Um, I don't based on what we're seeing from other from school districts that are go going back to being in person and what their um, COVID numbers look like. I don't think we will actually be back in person, but the, the spring schedule will have this listed as hybrid. Um, once again, it's probably going to be um, fully distance labs, but there's a, um, there's a possibility we'll be able to do some in-person labs However, if we do go to that, we'll make sure that there are distance options for anybody who can't come back, um, you know, due to geography or health concerns or anything like that. Um, but just so before you see it show up in the schedule as hybrid and get panicked, um, you know, I know all you guys, you guys can talk to me if you need, if you feel very strongly one way or the other, 
realistically, um, especially considering we got an email. I don't know if you guys saw it that uh, some of the hybrid classes that are meeting on campus right now, um, they had two people test positive for COVID in one of those hybrid classes. Um, so we're, you know, that's not a lot, but that entire class is now quarantined until um, for 14 days. So, you know, there's still, it's still out there and with LTUSD going back supposedly on Monday, um, our community is likely to get hit with some more cases. So it's, it would be pretty unlikely for our spring to look significantly different than what we're doing right now. Um, then again, that's six months from now in, in 2020 time, that's, that's like a decade. So who knows? Anyway, um, when we're, if we're trying to draw our Newman projection for the, um, for the way it's currently drawn, so we're looking at it from between carbon three and carbon four. So carbon on carbon three, we're looking at it from the left-hand side towards the right-hand side, down into the right would be a methyl group, stick, which would be sticking out of the board when we first looked at it. Straight up would be an ethyl group. And you can either do the condensed structure by just writing C2H5, that's generally understood in OCHEM to mean an ethyl group, or you can write CH2CH3, kind of more accurately shows what the, um, or how big it is. Would be that, that group to the left of carbon three. And then the last would be a hydrogen. If we wanted, and then if we're looking at the, the back carbon, carbon four, it has only one substituent besides hydrogen, right? And that one substituent is an ethyl group pointed straight down the way it's currently drawn. The other two substituents are both going to be hydrogens. So if we wanted to try and figure out what the best possible lowest energy confirmation would be, it's already not looking that bad, right? Is this already in the lowest energy confirmation? Or is there a way we can draw it to be more stable? I think it's already at the most stable point it could be. Yeah, so if we... in we might look at this, my first thought was, okay, is there a way we can get this red ethyl group to be further away from the methyl, but not without getting it closer to the other big group, right? Because if we took this, if we rotated the, the red um, substituents, we can get this ethyl up here, but then it's adjacent to the other big group. So this is already going to be in our most stable configuration. What would the highest energy confirmation look like? Would you spin it? So the CH2, CH3 was up closer so, to the one? Yeah, our, our highest energy is going to be a transition state, right? And so it's going to be in an eclipsed confirmation where we get our two biggest groups overlapping with each other. So if we did that, the main thing is, again, these two hydrogens being identical, we can't really tell the difference between them, but we're not just trying to switch things. We want to take it, those red ones and rotate everything. So if we're going to put this ethyl group eclipsed with the other ethyl group, we're gonna wind up with those hydrogens rotating along with it. And so our highest energy confirmation we leave all the blue ones where they are. And we 
we've rotated this, everything that's in red, 180 degrees from where it started. You can get a little creative with how you're drawing it to make, to make room for everything. And even just trying to draw these things that kind of can you give you a sense of why they're going to you know push against each other right it's almost impossible to actually get this drawn on a flat piece of paper because there's just not enough room to write everything for both of those ethyls right so that's similar to what it's like in three dimensions they're just physically going to take up space in that space uh, and that means that they're they're basically going to push each other away And if we were looking for, if we were looking for the highest stable state that wasn't a transition state, so what's the highest energy state we could have that is um, that's not eclipsed? There are two ways we can rotate these to make a staggered conformer that's not eclipsed. Um, because those eclipsed ones, those, those are only, it's only going to occupy those eclipsed positions, those transition states for a split second. Just like our bowling ball at the top of Spooner is only going to stay there for a fraction of a second before it starts rolling one way or the other. So if we're, if we're trying to find the, the least stable, stable state, if that makes sense, we're trying to find the higher altitude stable state for the bowling ball. There are two options we can have. We can have the two ethyls. This would be our most stable staggered state. Then there are two options. We could move the ethyl group over here, or we could put it over here. We could rotate the red, the red ones clockwise or counterclockwise. Which one of them is going to be the least stable conformer? If you were to rotate it counterclockwise? If we rotated the reds counterclockwise, why? Because uh, not only are the two ethyl groups close together, but you also have that methyl group close together as well. Yeah, so we can put that that red ethyl gauche to both of the other big groups. And then the, uh, the hydrogen that was here rotates over. This hydrogen rotates down. That's going to be a, less stable than if we rotated the red ones counter or clockwise. They're both going to be uphill in energy from this one, but this one's going to be more uphill in energy because you have two unfavorable interactions happening as opposed to just one. So I don't think people usually believe me when I say things like, oh, Oakham doesn't have any math in, in it, or um, you know, it's it's a lot more, it's a lot more hand wavy than than Gen Chem. There's a lot less problem solving as far as uh, conversions and numbers go, right? It's still tricky concepts, but it's a lot more trying to wrap your head around things and being able to visualize things than it is um, you know, numerically problem solving. So it's, it's a different kind of hard than Gen Chem. Um, Sean, can you go yeah. back to drawing that Newman projection real quick? Yeah. Do you have anything specifically? Um, no, I just didn't follow. Like I get how everything rotates, um, but I'm a little confused about how you drew that. Okay. So if I'm, I'm gonna share screen for a second and then um, while I'm drawing the, um, the starting point here. Um, so if we're, it's hexane, right? So this is gonna be methyl hexane. One, two, three, four, five, six. And on carbon three, we have a methyl group sticking out. 
So if we are trying to if we are trying to draw as though we were looking along that line at this molecule here. So we're stepping into the board, looking at it from the left-hand side of the molecule. The There's carbon three, carbon four. That's the bond we're looking along. So the blue circle that I drew here is representing carbon three. If I drew a the, the carbon four, it would be directly behind carbon three. Gotcha. That makes a lot more sense. I, I think I was just looking at the molecule from left to right instead of along that, that plane. Yeah, and that's 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 going to be key is that it's always going to line up along a bond. You're always going to be looking down a bond when we're doing these projections. If you can remember that, it's a little bit trickier to orient yourself, but then drawing it gets a lot simpler. It's always going to look something like this if you're dealing with two tetrahedral carbons. Everybody else feeling okay about that? I have a quick question. Yeah. I think you probably already went over it, but I just wanted to clarify it. So the energy graph from before, um, so a lower energy state would be less stable. So like, is that true? That's backwards. Oh, okay. Glad I asked. <laughs> so low energy is more stable. Okay. So the drawings that you had on the board. So then when the one you just erased where the methyl and the ethyl groups were closest together, that would have been least stable, right? Or less stable. So it would have had a higher energy. Right. And so if, okay. if you're trying to draw what a potential energy surface might look like, just, just qualitatively, not trying to put numbers to it, not yeah. it in scale. Having the two ethyl groups opposite from each other, let's call that zero, because that's going to be our most stable state. And then if we rotate the red ones counterclockwise, we'd wind up getting something that looks like this, where we're now less stable than we were. If we rotated the red ones clockwise, then we wound up still getting something less stable than where we started, but more stable than that. And so that would be somewhere in between the two. And then as far as what the, the transition state barriers are looking like, you just basically are adding up what's eclipsing what to get whether that what's the transition state gonna look like. So if we're rotating these counterclockwise, the red ones counterclockwise, you get an ethyl eclipsing a methyl, which is not stable. If we go the other way, we wind up with a hydrogen eclipsing an ethyl, hydrogen eclipsing ethyl, and hydrogen eclipsing methyl. So that would, we would expect that one to be a little bit lower in energy to get to that transition state. And I didn't leave myself enough room. So something looks more a little bit more like that. All right. So, and this is the this is the level that I, that we're trying to understand. I don't expect you to be able to pull out numbers off the top of your head, but just relatively speaking, it's easier to ro rotate the red ones clockwise because we're going to have fewer bad eclipse eclipsing interactions compared to if we rotated them, the red ones counterclockwise, we get more big, big groups that have to push past each other. Sorry, I'm gonna move my cat out of the way. Um, And again, yeah, lower energy is more stable. Just like in physics terms, if, it, if, I, if I put a, a golf ball on my desk versus a golf ball on the floor of my office, they both might be stable. If nothing happens, it might stay in both of those positions, but it's gonna be more stable if it's sitting on the floor. 
because if there's a random earthquake or my kids run by outside, which sounds about the same thing, um, then you're more likely for that golf ball at the top to roll off and fall to a more stable state. The golf ball that's already on the ground is not going to, is it might move, but it's not going to get any lower. It's more stable. Or if the cat walks by, as she just knocked my pen off my desk, as cats do. All right. One more concept before we're, we're gonna call it for the day. Um, and that's bringing in, talking about um, ring structures. So one of the reasons that these, these different alkane conformers were not as stable is because when you have these big groups pushing on each other, that basically makes the shape of the carbons not be fully tetrahedral. Because if you have these big things that are taking up space, pushing each other away, that's going to affect the bond angles a little bit, right? You're going to be able, those two big objects are going to push each other away a little bit more, and they're not going to be able to be um, in the same state they normally would be. Go back to our 250-pound men in the back seat of a car. Those two 250-pound guys are going to be leaning against the doors, right? Likely, depending on your car. They're not, if there was nobody in the seat next to them, they'd be sitting straight. But having two big guys in the back seat, they're going to slightly push each other apart, even if not physically, just sort of, you know, giving each other space. They're both going to be more stable, kind of leaning outward. That's similar to what's going to happen to these tetrahedral structures um, if you have these two big groups right next to each other. They're going to push each other away. And, and that deviates, that makes the bond angles change and become a little bit less stable. Um, we can force things to have unstable bond angles if we make um, ring structures. So ring structures in particular, if we can, uh, if we have a bond, if we have bond angles that do not allow our carbons to be tetrahedral, because they're forcing two of the electron groups, two of the sigma bonds to be much closer to each other than normal. Um, so, for instance, if we had a cyclopropane group, if it's cyclopropane, then all of those all of those points on the triangle are identical, right? It's a nice, it's a equilateral triangle, which means the angle between any of those two carbon-carbon bonds is only sixty degrees. But carbons that are tetrahedral are most stable when they're at one hundred and nine degrees from each other, right? One hundred and nine point five, roughly. It's a measured number, not exact. Um, so if we can force them to be much closer to each other than they want to be by keeping them in this ring structure, that's like a more extreme version of what we were just talking about. And so we refer to that as strain energy, when we can actually quantify how much strain energy is, there is, um, and it's going to be related to how close are those carbon-carbon bonds. Um, and in nature especially, but, but also in, um, in the lab, we almost never are going to be able to make a cyclopropyl group. A cyclopropane group is gonna be super unstable because of how close you're forcing those things to be. It's almost always going to react really, really quickly to form some more stable structure. It's gonna rearrange itself somehow, um, whether that means it just reacts with the oxygen to make CO2, um, or something else. So these would be molecules that are super likely to, to react just by, you know, if you dropped a beaker full of cyclopropane, um, it might detonate. So like that level of instability. Um, back in the 60s and 70s, the mil US military started um, funding research into developing new explosives um, looking at strained alkanes as the fuel source. Um, by they, and so one of my myochem professor actually made a molecule that was two cyclopropanes linked together, um, basically taking a cyclohexane and forcing the opposite corners close together um, so that you wound up making something that looked like like this. I know I. I'm still sharing. 
if, we, if this was our skeletal structure, this would be a super unstable molecule. It's going to try and rearrange itself basically any way it can. Um, and so they're, you know, it didn't actually pan out um, as a as an explosive because it was too reactive. Explosives, you want them to, you know, wait to explode until you get them where they're supposed to go. Usually, is a is a favorable characteristic um, in a, in an explosive. Um, and this one, they couldn't get it to be stable enough to do that. It releases a lot of energy very, very quickly, but it wasn't stable enough to actually use in the field. So Sean, would a benzene ring be more or less stable than uh, hexane? So benzenes are gonna be more stable, but that has to do with, that, with all the resonance that can happen. Gotcha, not the strain energy because right. it would have more, it would have strain energy. It has some strain energy, although if you have, if your bond angle is, is too big compared to what you want it to be, like if you're looking at cyclohexane, cyclohexane's got 120 degrees, which is not 109, right? But the fact that it's too big, you can actually work in three dimensions to actually change that shape a little bit to actually keep all of those carbons closer to that 109 degrees. So cyclopentane, when it's flat, is really close to having the right bond angles, right? Cyclohexane actually changes shape in 3D so that all of those carbons can be tetrahedral um, and be closer to that bond angle, which we will deal with next time. Um, but we can, and we can actually see that if we look at heats of combustion as a function of number of carbons in a ring, you give off a whole bunch of energy if you burn cyclopropane. You give off a little bit less energy if you burn cyclobutane. Cyclopentane is even a little bit less. Cyclohexane though, despite the fact that it looks like it should be 120 degrees, actually has the lowest heat of combustion. And that has to do with that three-dimensional structure. So I, we were, you actually asked the question that was leading exactly where I was trying to go. Why doesn't cyclopentane have the lowest heat of combustion? Because if we actually look at the steric, so this would be why cyclopropane is the highest, in order to, to have the structure of the um, be a ring structure, you actually wind up with those orbitals not being able to overlap with each other very much. You're, you're, they're still being forced away from each other. And so you wind up not with a ton of, of overlap between these orbitals. Cyclobutane has a little bit less strain, but it has more strain on the ring structure in general. It actually winds up with those carbons being 88 degrees from each other, not 90 degrees. Um, because that allows those hydrogens to then be further apart from each other and not be stuck in a stagger into an eclipsed conformation. So back here, if we look at the Newman, Newman projection here, it, it is not a totally flat molecule. The three carbons have to be in the same plane because there's only three of them. But those hydrogens basically are slightly twisted so that they're not full, not completely eclipsed. That keeps the hydrogens away from each other a little bit. And cyclobutane does something similar. And rather than being a flat structure, they call it puckered. It's a puckered square. By basically, if you take a flat square and you bend the two corners up, the opposite corners up. And that actually makes the carbon-carbon bonds be a little bit closer together, but it keeps the hydrogen bonds from being eclipsed as much. They're slightly staggered then. And if we look at cyclopentane, we get something similar. It's not a flat pentagon, despite the fact that would make it so that it has pretty low angles strain. It would make the angles almost perfect if it was totally flat, if you had 108 degrees between all the carbons. But that would mean all of the hydrogens would have to be eclipsed. They would all be the same angles relative to each other. And so all of that eclipse energy, and that's what they're referring to as torsional strain, basically, which torsional strain is comes from the same root as torque. 
it's torquing the shape, the, the geometric shape, the pentagon in this case, to not be flat in order to make it so those hydrogens cannot be eclipsed. So we will end by looking at, so this would be if we looked down this bond angle here of a cyclopentane, you can see that by, by having the, adding that torsional strain, by tweaking it so it's not flat, you make the carbons a little bit closer together, but it allows your hydrogens to be closer to a staggered conformation. And then the last, so I'm just going to show you hexane, and then we'll spend lots of time on hex cyclohexane in a second. Because cyclohexane has 120 degrees, if it was flat, that gives us more room to actually take it and make it a three-dimensional shape so that all of the heart hydrogens and carbon-carbon and bonds can be in an eclipsed, or sorry, in a staggered conformation instead of being locked into being eclipsed. So cyclohexanes are actually more stable than cyclopentanes because of that torsional strain, because of the eclipsed interactions, right? And so the two stable conformers of cyclohexane actually are called, they're called the chair and the boat. Boat, because if you draw this without all the hydrogens, it looks like a little canoe. And the chair, because it's kind of looks like a zero gravity chair, like a, a little recliner. You imagine it without the hydrogens drawn. Right? And so we'll talk a lot about how we can take these and adjust the structure to make them more or less stable and what how stable these conformers are next week. Right? Um, I believe the quiz has some, has some nomenclature questions, um, but I believe it's mostly going to be draw a Newman projection, predict what's more stable kind of stuff, stuff we we're going over today. Um, and uh, and we'll go over those answers on Tuesday as well. Any any last minute? I know we, we went over that last stuff quickly and we'll cover it again, but any last minute questions before we're good for the day, for the week? No, I'm good. Okay, um, good, because I have labs starting in eight minutes. So I'm gonna run. Um, I have office hours three to four today. If you guys have any questions, um, stop by. Awesome. Thank you, Sean. Thanks, Sean. Bye, guys. Have a good weekend. Sean.